Gracias por invitarme a este congreso. Uh, lo siento porque mi español no es muy bueno, pero me gusta mucho conocer a ustedes. Y ojalá que uh, ustedes van a decir uh, sus ideas filosóficas uh, hoy o mañana. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I just extended my whole Spanish conference right there. Probably said several ungrammatical things while I was at it. But uh, I'm really pleased to be here. It's fun. I really enjoyed the talk. I'm looking forward to all the talks uh, in the rest of the workshop. Today, what I want to talk about is uh, the phenomenon of being brought down by how somebody else treats you or reacts to you or thinks about you. And we all have this phenomenon. We all know what it is to be depersonalized or. Uh, Diminish the somebody else's treatment of us. It might happen, for example, because tomorrow you give a great talk and somebody sits there congratulating you on your talk says, See, I told you that if you don't drink coffee, you'll be less nervous. And that's not the same thing as being excited about what you did. Uh, similarly, if you publish your first paper uh, in philosophical studies or news and you're really excited about your argument and somebody says, Then you log online onto a philosophical blog and you find people discussing, Oh, so that's what people at Unum are interested in nowadays. It's not a way of being engaged with your ideas. It's a way of being treated as an object of sociological interest. Those are kinds of examples of the kinds of ways of being brought down that I'm interested in. One from life, I think, and one from philosophy. And all the examples of the interesting word have parallels like that, where some will come from life and some will come from philosophy. Okay. There's a very attractive, so philosophers, I think, are particularly interested in these ways of being brought down, particularly from the contrast between engage with our ideas, respond to the content of the talk that we get today or tomorrow, and the content of our paper, and being interpreted in a way that just treats us as part of the, the order of nature. It's merely one thing to be predicted or subject to sociological or psychological explanation. I think this is very deep in philosophy. It goes back at least to Socrates, who I think instilled this idea that part of philosophy is engagement with ideas for their own sake. And I think for all of us, when we entered philosophy for the first time, we found something exciting about this. We found something exciting about either the idea that you can engage with ideas with regard, without regard for the progeny, or even that it was exciting to be, to be pushed by the danger of some obviously false ideas that look like they've got arguments that are worth engaging with, even if we know things about their. So we're interested in things like, what are the, what's the import of Nietzsche's arguments later in life, not whether they're explained by, for example, whether he was syphilitic or had some other condition. Uh, those are not the kinds of things that philosophers were interested in. Okay? And there are very romanticized ideas that many people in philosophy have about what it is to be treated as a person rather than a thing. For example, con contrast persons as a kind of noumena with respect to things which are phenomena. And with that come a lot of other Kantian contrasts. So for example, uh, persons according to, act according to their conception of laws, whereas things are moved around by the laws of nature. And so that means that persons are correspondingly autonomous, whereas things are heteronomous. And that same distinction comes back in other philosophers, the distinction between the space of reasons and the space of causes, okay, whether persons are part of engagement in the participant stance and things are part of the objective stance. The sharp contrast between persons and things comes back over and over and over. And in many ways, it's heavily romanticized. Okay? Now, what I want to do in this talk is I want to grant, I want to figure out what is this right about this idea and attractive about it, despite the fact that I think that when it's over romanticized, it leads us to some bad places. Okay? So I think that there is a version of this idea that's too strong, and I want to articulate the version of the idea that's too strong, not because I think that anybody has importantly defended the too strong version of the idea, but because I think it's a dangerous uh, thing that we need to steer ourselves away from. And be careful to steer ourselves away from. Okay. So the big ideas for the talk today is that persons really are a kind of thing. We're creatures of flesh and blood. We're constituted by our bodies. There are causal explanations of why we do what we do. Um, I think it follows from this. And this will not be argued directly, but I think it's going to emerge from what I say. That it can't be wrong to treat a person as a thing. Okay. It can only be wrong to treat a person as the wrong kind of thing. Okay. And so we're going to learn something about when it is that we've treated somebody inappropriately as a thing by learning something about the kind of thing the persons are. And understanding the kind of thing the persons are is going to help us understand which ways to treat people as things. Because people are things, are okay, and not diminishing, and contrast which ways to treat people as things 
are diminishing because they involve treating people as the wrong kind of things. Okay, so that's where I'm going. And I'm going to start with some examples because I think the best way into this is all very abstract. And I gave two very simple examples up front, but I want to give some more examples and get a little bit deeper into this thought so I can start to motivate this over romanticized thought that I want to push back against. The example I want to start with uh, is the example about that I've had with Maria's compliment. So Maria, my wife, comes home from work. She hops out of the car. She uh, looks at my jasmine vines and how they're coming in, and she compliments me. She says, oh, they're coming in so well, Mark. Bear in mind, it's been three years since I planted them, and they're kind of, they're kind of scraggly. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, so one thing that I might do in response to this, which I think, I hope I wouldn't do, is to wonder to myself, I wonder if she found a coin in a vending machine this afternoon. I take it that that would be a bad sign about a relationship that she compliments me, and I think, huh, she must have had a good day. Right? Okay, there's something that diminishes her. It prevents her from making a contribution to our relationship, of having a basis for conversation that's a real contribution, that would be an object of pride, that I should be proud of her response or grateful for it. Okay, and it interprets her in these causal terms. And there's something that seems weird about this, despite the fact that we all know that people are more likely to give compliments when they're in good moods. And we also all know that people are more likely to be in good moods when previous good things have happened to them. And we know, particularly because we've read about it in psychology journals, that finding coins of vending machines happens to be one of those things. Okay, so, so we know all these things. And knowing all those things, I think, is not enough to make it the case that this is all totally cool as a way of interpreting what's going on with my life. There's something that's problematic about it. And particularly in the context of a close interpersonal relationship, that's why I use the example of marriage, but also in general, as a way of your first response to somebody, or even a second or a third response. There's something that's weird about resorting to these causal hypotheses. Okay. Here's another example. So the first example is from life, the second example from philosophy. So Victor publishes an important article in a leading journal in ethics that is all about trying to articulate the nature of harms that might be perpetuated on people of underrepresented groups who are successful by affirmative action policies. So Victor is really concerned, he thinks that's underappreciated, what kind of harm this might be perpetuated this way, it's something that's important to recognize. And Spencer reads the thesis of Victor's article, and Spencer knows that Victor is a successful black philosopher. And Spencer thinks, of course he's going to think that. Okay. That brings Victor down. It's a horrible, I think, response to picking up an article by somebody is to attribute that response to, uh, in this simple, ham-fisted way to the nature of their experience or what, what, what group they belong to, okay? Again, it's something that brings you down, and we can notice some of the same things about it. it um, he's interpreted uh, Victor's article in causal terms rather than in rational terms. He hasn't engaged with the argument or figure out what's in front of the thesis. He read that little abstract in the, that appears at the front first page of the ethics article. And he's come to this conclusion. Um, and so like my interpretation of Maria, not my interpretation, I didn't really do this, but, but like, like an example of Maria's compliment, like that interpretation, he's interpreting Victor in causal terms. Okay? In each of these cases, I think that there's a kind of diminishment. There's a way in which this kind of response is distinctively not a mode of rational response, or of what you might call engagement, but rather a kind of uh, reacting to or treating somebody as an object of study, as somebody that you might uh, understand as opposed to engagement. And one way of drawing that out is through a really helpful comparison that Strassen makes between what he calls the participant stance and the objective stance. And so Strassen says that the participant stance is the stance that you take toward a person uh, when you make them the appropriate object of a wide variety of what Strassen calls reactive attitudes, which include not only the famous examples of blame uh, uh, and indignation, but also uh, other examples of things like love and forgiveness and understanding. You are not going to love or forgive somebody for something that, uh, unless you're treating them as a person, the kind of person who could be forgiven for what they did. So for example, if, uh, uh, and I'm not, you're not going to be grateful for what people do if you see it as merely part of the causal order. So if uh, Maria, I respond to Maria this way, I think she found a coin of any machine, it would be really weird if we go on and be grateful for that compliment. And a certain kind of pride, where it would be weird if I went on to have a certain pride in what my wife thought of my garden skills. Okay? And that kind of pride and that gratitude are in the family of what Strassen calls participant attitudes, 
They're attitudes that are distinctive of or paradigmatic of how we form our interpersonal relationships with each other. And when we interpret somebody in causal terms in these ways, it does seem like it washes out or, or uh, screens off these participant attitudes. Similarly, I think there's a kind of way of being convinced by what somebody says that you might call rational persuasion. And rational persuasion is different from just being thinking about what they said and then convincing yourself. Sometimes this happens, somebody comes to you with an idea, you listen to them for a little bit, and, uh, and you think, hey, oh, I know why. And that's what they were telling you, but you didn't hear from them, you heard it from yourself. Maybe you don't do this, but I have to admit that I've done it before. We should kind of be reflecting about this. So, so sometimes there's a way in which somebody says something, you change your mind, but you're not rationally persuaded by them. They're the, the, the instigator for you changing your mind, but they don't rationally persuade you. And it might be, I'm not imagining Spencer in the first class is doing this, but it might be that Spencer, that Spencer actually does change his mind about uh, the harms of affirmative action policies as a result of reading Victor's article uh, um, uh, in a way that doesn't involve rational persuasion. But it would be weird, I think, for him to be rationally persuaded, given that his hypothesis about how Victor got to his conclusion uh, is described as a straightforward causal terms. So again, I think the kind of explanation or interpretation that Spencer gives of Victor washes out or screens off the kinds of attitudes that are distinctive of relations to persons, rational persuasion, as opposed to something that could be a way of relating to a thing, but merely being the occasion for changing your mind. So I think this terminology from Strassen is really helpful, uh, but I also think this terminology from Strassen really sets us up for seeing a diagnosis of what's going on in both the case of Maria's complement and the case of Victor and Spencer that I think is misguided. And that uh, diagnosis, I think, comes out in the passage that I have on the handout, which comes from a really, really wonderful paper by by Langton called Bleeding Desolation. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, Langton's describing a case in which she refers to respond with resentment to something her neighbor does, but then comes to see it as interpreting causal terms. It's coming from some compulsion or problem that he has. And he says, when this happens, I stop thinking of him as an agent whose reasons, mysterious though they might be, I can in principle come to understand. My neighbor becomes a problem to be managed an obstacle to be avoided, not a person to be argued with. In fact, it becomes just one more of the houses of Elwood, along with the threat of the flooding canal. I've switched from the participant standpoint, that's the Strasselian term, what Strassen calls the objective. That's the standpoint Strassen describes with respect to related things, okay? This is the attitude we have to things, items in the natural order whose behavior is explicable under causal laws, and manipulated, if you know enough about them. Uh, again, that's the topic in both Strassen and Kant. To adopt it is to see a person as, perhaps, in her she quotes from Strassen, an object of social policy, a subject for what, in a wide range of sense, might be called treatment, someone to be managed or handled or cured or trained. Back to LinkedIn. Strassen says that although the two attitudes are deeply opposed to one another, they don't exclude one another. We can step back and observe people as we observe the planets. We can observe our friends rising in anger as if it were the rising of the canal waters, something to be feared and avoided, not to be understood and respected. We can cast an objective eye on our students, our friends, our lovers, and no doubt we often do when the interactive stance proves too exhausting. Kant would say that when we do this, we fail to treat people as human, as agents in the kingdom of ends, as ends in themselves. Okay, so there's an idea that I think is really suggested by this passage. I don't want to hit it on LinkedIn, okay? But, the, but this is the passage that got me really thinking about this idea, okay? And this idea is that the reason why, the diagnosis of what's so problematic about what's going on in my response to Maria, and Maria's compliment, and in Spencer's response to Victor, in their case, is that we're interpreting in causal terms. And causal interpretation, according to this diagnosis, is proprietary to the object of stance. The object of stance, the way of relating to things as things, part of the order of nature uh, is interpreting them in causal terms, okay? That's Kant's idea that uh, noumena are pulled around by laws of nature rather than acting according to their this called, conception of laws, okay? And the second part of this diagnosis is that the objective stance precludes the participant stance, that when you relate to somebody as a thing, when you relate to them as part of the objective stance, it's a consequence of that that you're not also in that instance, relating to them as a person, 
as a kind of appropriate object of reactive attitudes. Okay? And so when you put these two parts together, you get the diagnosis that causal interpretation is going to involve diminishment because it will necessarily involve treating somebody as a thing rather than a person. Treating them as a person requires engaging the participant stance. And causal interpretation is inconsistent with the participant stance. Okay? It's consistent with going back and forth. I could first engage in the participant stance and then get exhausted, as LinkedIn puts it, and switch over to the object of stance. But there's something that's intention of simultaneously engaging in the participant stance and the object of stance. Okay. So I think this is a really, really attractive idea. And there's something that's deeply right about it. But there's also something that's wrong with that. I want to try and bring it up. We're bringing up some other cases. First case uh, comes from life. Uh, so suppose that instead of coming home and, com and compliment me on the jasmine line, Marie comes home and complains. She's like, why is that jasmine not coming in? Okay. And at first I say, well, last week you complimented it. And she says, whatever, I was just being nice. I found a coin vending machine. Or, or, the, or I, say, I say, look, uh, uh, you know, jasmine requires a lot of water. And we cut back in order to respect uh, the state of California and Glendale's rules about how to deal with the drought. And she's like, whatever. Uh, uh, you told me when we bought this house that like you replaced the bougainvillea with jasmine. Like, yeah, I did tell everyone about the house that there's the bougainvillea with jasmine. Okay. And but at some point, I think uh, if she's not responsive to these, these answers, like she just remains equally upset about this, I could keep trying to answer this, or I could say, oh yeah, you're right, it's horrible. I'm really sorry that I haven't violated the water rules that we agreed that we comply with. You know, but at some point, maybe it seems reasonable for me to conclude maybe she had a bad day. Maybe the fact that she had a bad day explains why she's upset about the jasmine vine today when she wasn't last week. Maybe the fact that she, and after all, she does have bad days. We all have bad days. And my wife has a hard job. So it seems like a reasonable thing to wonder what possibly happened. And how I'm going to engage with her is going to change if I recognize that, that her response is driven more by the fact that she had a bad day than by what kind of contribution she's trying to make to our horticultural practices at our home. Okay. So, uh, so if she says, um, if that's the interpretation I come to, then maybe instead of trying to answer her or just like, agree with her and move on from that, say, well, so what are the consequences? How should we move forward in our relationship, even though I've done a terrible job of gardening? Okay. Or no, I haven't done a terrible job of gardening. Let's keep working on this. Maybe the right thing to do to move forward is to say, oh, so how was your day? Okay. <laughs> and move past it. And if you don't interpret where something's coming from in the right way, you might not be able to do that in the right way. So I think it would be not only okay uh, if at some point, maybe not the first thing, if she comes home and says, the jasmine vine sucks, honey, and I say, oh, you must have had a bad day, uh, that, that also seems like it brings her down, okay? But at some point early on, it seems like it could be a reasonable interpretive tool for me. And I think that sharply contrasts with the coin of that machine. And the important point, though, is that it is interpretation in couple terms, and it does not screen off personal engagement, right? Here's another case. So that case was from life. This case is from philosophy. So Fred publishes a serious article, uh, 30 pages long, in an ethics journal about the characterological implications of manipulative marketing practices. So it's like in the journal of the ethics of marketing. Okay. And Allison reads this paper. She's writing a dissertation about the ethics of marketing. She wants to take really seriously this idea from this leading scholar. Uh, Fred about the ethics of manipulative marketing practices. And she gets really stuck over this 12 page digression in the paper where Fred develops this complicated set of terminology that she's never seen before. And at some point, it clicks to her that he's trying to reinvent the analytic synthetic distinction <laughs> because he was a PhD student at Harvard in the 1960s. And he probably has like a twine on his shoulder. And really, she comes to the conclusion. The right explanation of why he's got this 12-page digression is not that there's something really complicated going on in the paper, but rather he's just got a hang-up. And the thesis would be have obvious counterexamples if it wasn't qualified with the word analytic or synthetic. And he's really uncomfortable doing that, so he has to invent other terminology to do it. Okay? And so what she does in her dissertation is she cites Fred and said, engages with his ideas and describes his view in terms of analyticity and syntheticity, whatever, whatever it is. Okay, so that's what she does. Okay, so she interprets him, and that she actually describes his view in terms that he disavows. Okay, 
That sounds really strong. It sounds like it's kind of lack of respect for what Fred says his view is. Fred doesn't use those terms to describe me as view. He might even say in the article, I'm not talking about this. Okay. But nevertheless, she's, there's this big interpretive obstacle to understand what's going on in this paper. And the point at which she gets past the interpretive obstacle is the point at which she interprets it in causal terms as the kind of hangout from his inner coin. And she says, if we want to figure out what kind of contribution this paper makes to the ethics of manipulative marketing practice, we kind of have to see past this 12-page diagram. Maybe it's a really interesting view about the analytic synthetic distinction, but, but uh, that's uh, orthogonal to his contribution to the ethics of manipulative marketing practices. And so we still, even if we thought he was right about what's going on, we still, in order to best understand the contribution of the part of the paper about the ethics of manipulative marketing practices, we have to screen it up in causal terms. And that, I think, can be OK. I think it's not obviously wrong. OK? All right. So I want to point out that um, in each of these cases, uh, there are a variety of reasons why you might think that these are OK. One reason you might think that they're OK is just you describe the case and you think, oh, yeah. That's not so bad. But also, I think we can converge on the idea that this can be OK, because often people can change their mind about their own best interpretation of what's going on in themselves. Often it could be the case that after the fact, looking back, you say, oh, yeah, I really did have a big hang up at that point. Like, thanks for working me through that. Okay? <laughs> uh, or, or actually, no, I did have a bad day. I'm really sorry I took it out on you. Those are ways that we can relate to our own past selves. And it would be weird if it's okay for somebody who relates to their own past selves and somebody who is their friend or their lover or somebody who really wants to engage with them in a close way don't respect the fact that in a more considered moment, that's a conclusion that they themselves might come to. It seems like it's, it's a hypothesis that if they should be ready to adopt it, there should get something intrinsically weird about you adopting it. And I don't want to say that always of looking back. Sometimes I think we're, we're wrong. Later on, something happens and we look back and we reinterpret ourselves and we're wrong to think this. Maybe there was something really important going on, and it would be wrong for somebody to change their mind. But the fact that somebody could rationally change their mind and not think that they're a mistake is something that I think ought to open us up to this idea that third parties could do so as well. Okay. Um, one really important point I want to make about these examples, especially because I talked a little bit about Strassen, and what many people know about Strassen on freedom and resentment, uh, is that he's concerned with moral responsibility and free will, and paradigmatic of moral responsibility is praise and blame, uh, is that the examples I've just been giving of Maria's complaint and Fred Dawson are not just cases of excuse. Okay. The, 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 my first set of cases are not just cases where uh, it's important to praise somebody, and I won't praise them if I interpret them in causal terms. Uh, the second cases are not just cases of cases where I'll blame them unless I interpret them in causal terms. It's not obvious that somebody's praiseworthy for complimenting you. Okay, maybe if you are a real <laughs> jerk, uh, it like is really special for them to find something to compliment about you because they know you're having a bad day, and maybe there is something praiseworthy about that. But in typical cases of compliments, what's significant about compliments isn't that they're praiseworthy, but rather that they are a contribution to a relationship. They're a move to which various responses are merited. So in complimenting somebody, that merits responses like like uh, demurment from the comp, whatever, if that's a word, saying, oh no, not me, uh, I'm not good at this, uh, or, uh, or gratitude uh, for the compliment, or, uh, or returning and complimenting them, uh, or being proud. Those are all responses that make sense if something's a contribution to an ongoing dialogue or relationship between two people. It's not just a matter of praise. And those are the things that I think are screened up by interpretation in causal terms. Likewise, uh, with Fred and Allison, I think, uh, sorry, with uh, the complaint case, it's not just the case that it's blameworthy to complain about something. Often it's not blameworthy to complain about something. Sometimes it's really important to complain about things that are, for example, injustices or things that have been going bad for a while and you haven't spoken up. Sometimes it's important to step up and complain about those things in those cases. For example, if Maria's been bugged about this vine for a long time and she hasn't been telling me about it, and as a result, I think everything's okay, and she's happy with how the front of her house looks. And really, and really it might be important for her to come forward. And even though I think there's something weird about this, normally she likes it, so i got to interpret this in causal terms, I would be wrong in that case to interpret her in causal terms. It would be important for her to come forward, and maybe even praiseworthy for her to come forward. So these cases, I think, are not just about praise and blame. And so the cases 
the fact that it's sometimes okay to interpret causal terms, I think, is much more general than the idea that uh, excuses often come in the form of interpretation in causal terms, okay? which I think is clear in Strasson. Um, and one thing I think is brought up by this contrast is a difference that I, I'm looking for vocabulary to describe this, but I think it's the difference between contributions and effects. So what I think is that uh, the things that are part of the participant stance, the things that are appropriate to have attitudes like rational persuasion toward, or uh, forgiveness, or gratitude, or resentment, um, are, uh, are contributions to a relationship. Okay, they're, all, they're not just effects on the relationship, but they're things that are contributions to the relationship. Okay? Uh, and I think it's possible to even resent some things that aren't contributions of that kind. So for example, it might be that, uh, uh, that Allison resents Fred for not having the self-discipline to realize that he has a hang-up about the Hamlet synthetic distinction. Okay? And so actually, in interpreting him in causal terms, uh, it's not that she doesn't resent him for this 12-page passage. She does resent him. She thinks this is the kind of thing that by the time you've been, uh, what, 1960s to 2018, by the time you've been doing philosophy for this long, uh, you should have figured out this kind of stuff and not make it so hard for me, a graduate student, to figure out. So I think it's even possible that you can resent people for things that you screen off in these causal terms when they are effects. Okay. What you resent is this effect and something about whether you should manage this effect. Nevertheless, you explain, this is not really a contribution going on in these 12 pages, okay? So you're not um, grateful for it, you're not rationally persuaded by it, and you screen it out in those ways. Okay. Um, so far, what I hope to have done is to have articulated this thought I find super attractive, and I explain why I think it goes too far. It's a, it's a little bit false, okay? And, uh, and I've been trying to use these examples both from life and from philosophy, just like you are what you eat in some sense. I think that you are in philosophy what you read. There's a picture of that in the back of the handout. Um, but somebody might try and respond. They might say, oh, I really like the sharp distinction uh, that comes from the Kantian thought. This idea that when you interpret something in causal terms, that implicates the object of stance. And when you interpret implicate the object of stance, that thereby screens off uh, engaging the participant stance. Okay. And so one thing that's already visible in the passage from LinkedIn is this idea that the object of a persistent stance is my alternate. And so one thing you might think is, look, there is a separate question about what's appropriate within the participant stance from when it's appropriate to engage in the participant stance. Okay? So sometimes it might be okay to engage in causal interpretation, not because causal interpretation is okay within the participant stance, which is something I want to later convince you is true, but rather because there are what the norms are about when to engage in the participant stance. For example, maybe when you're really exhausted from your interpersonal relationships, at those times it's totally okay to interpret somebody in causal terms, even your spouse, your close friend. Okay? And so this is what I call the, the, um, the two-stage strategy. The two-stage strategy says, look, there's two separate things going on. The mere fact that it's okay to interpret something in causal terms in these cases doesn't yet tell us that there's anything personal about that. That's okay within the personal stance. It just tells us that there's these extra norms about when to engage it. And maybe we can fluidly go back and forth. Maybe I can interpret something in causal terms and be in the objective stance, and then boom, be back in the participant stance, and boom, get exhausted, or whatever it is the norm to appeal to, to go back to the causal stance, and that'll be totally okay. And this, I think, is not right. It's not adequate to the things that went on in our cases. When and Maria comes home and complains about uh, Jasmine, and it seems appropriate for me to simultaneously admire how hardworking she is, and yet not uh, feel like her complaint about the Jasmine merits a response. Okay. And so the first point I want to make is that we don't just go back and forth between these things, even rapidly. Actually, sometimes at the very same time, we engage with somebody in a way that allows for some participant attitudes and screens up others, this is something I think Strassen acknowledged, so I think that in this, uh, in this way, he's not actually a target, what I'm saying, but I think it was a misunderstanding Strassen, or targets what I'm saying. But I think we go further, not only is it the case that at the one and the same time we can have participant attitudes toward one aspect of what somebody's doing, uh, and screen off participant attitudes toward another aspect of what they're doing, I actually think that in many of these cases, it's actually impossible to identify what to have the participant attitude toward or how to have it, 
unless we can avail ourselves of interpretation in causal terms. So take the case of um, uh, who are like Allison and Fred. I think that Allison succeeds at engaging with and being grateful for this important contribution in Fred's article that's the best objection to her view in her whole dissertation. Okay, That's something that she succeeds at, but she can't identify what it is unless she can help herself to identify where it is that the terminology that Fred is using lines up with the terminology that she would use. Okay? When she identifies that, which she's enabled to do precisely because she's able to say, to rid herself of a rationalizing explanation of the 12 page digression in the article and look instead for a causal explanation, it's something that's there just because he couldn't see past this hang up. Uh, that's what enables her to respond to what she does. So you can't, I think, put, say these are two separate things. Like on the one hand, there's this causal interpretation of some things, and those don't admit a, a rational response or rational persuasion. On the other hand, there's this other thing. Rather, I think they're integrated in an important way. I don't think that the Maria's complaint case is like that, but I think there are other cases in life that are like that. So for example, um, there's a big difference, I think, between how you respond to a uh, young sibling who's using misgendered pronouns on their sibling to get them angry, okay, and how you respond to a stroke victim who's no longer able to successfully apply gender of pronouns. Um, in the latter case, I think you have to see past the gender that they're using the pronouns. It's just not part of what's going on in what they're saying, and you just have to ignore it. Okay? Uh, and I think that you can't identify what they say unless you have simultaneously screened something off. Okay? So I think this two-stage strategy, two strategy is not going to be a way of pushing back. Okay? But there's something that I think I acknowledged before that it's very important to not miss in acknowledging that there is something that is not true about this Kantian plot. Okay. Before I mentioned that when I interpret Maria's compliment in causal terms, that screens off my ability to feel gratitude for the compliment. Okay. So there's, it kind of crowds it out. So when I interpret particular aspects of somebody's behavior in causal terms, that does have an effect on crowding out the way in which I can respond to those things. And that's something that I think we want to not lose out of an understanding of what's going on. So what I want to say is that the Strassonian picture is right, that there is a contrast between the personal stance, or the participant stance, and the objective stance, but that we're wrong to think that causal interpretation is proprietary to the objective stance. Rather, what I want to say is that causal interpretation is implicated in both the, the participant stance and the objective stance. And that's the case because persons are a kind of thing, and things are governed by laws of nature. So it can't be the case, it's because persons are a kind of thing, that it should be surprising if it turns out that you can interpret or understand persons while not availing yourself of the resources to understand them in any kind of causal terms. Okay? So that's where the general idea of persons as things comes in. I think this is the thing that allows us to keep what's attractive about the idea that there's two modes of engagement. This interpersonal mode of engagement that's distinctive of treating people as persons, and this other mode of engagement that's how we treat everything else. Um, um, is that that's exactly right. The only thing that's wrong is the first assumption of the Kantian thought, the one that says that interpretation through a causal lens is automatically objective. It's not automatically objective. Okay. Um, one last thing you might want to say to defend this stress on picture is to say, look, there are really, it's not the case that we go back and forth between the objective and the person, the person in stance, but rather that we engage in the object and the person in stance toward different aspects. Uh, and I don't think that's wrong. <coughs> if that is what the contrast between the object and the person in stance comes down to, that's something that I endorse. I think it is the case that when uh, uh, um, uh, Allison engages <laughs> with Fred, uh, there are parts of the article with which she's engaging, and there's parts of the article she's screening off. Likewise, I think that when you listen to the stroke victim use gender pronouns, I think there are parts of what they've said that you engage with and parts of it that you screen off. And the way you screen them off is you make them part of the causal background. They're sort of the way that um, you need to see past them, and if you succeed at seeing past them, and you can succeed at seeing past them in some cases, if you have met and talked to somebody who's got a disability with using gender pronouns, at first it's really difficult, and at some point you stop hearing the way that they're using their pronouns and are able to identify what it is that they have said in a way that is genderless. Okay? And it's similar to the way in which when you put on sunglasses, 
you start to see things in the same color. You see past the way that they've been filtered. So what I want to suggest is that engaging in the personal stance essentially involves these kinds of causal interpretation. But that when it does, what it does is it allows you to see past those things in order to see the person. Okay. So far, what I've argued for, I said something strong, what I've argued for is that it's okay. It's part of the <laughs> stance to engage in causal interpretation. What I now want to emphasize is that it's actually essential. There are many ways in which buying into this romanticized idea of philosophers that treating somebody uh, as a thing is very different from treating them as a person uh, can lead us to go astray, not in the way that we all worry about when we don't want to be brought down, okay, but in a quite different way, where there's a vice of over-rationalization of how we engage with others. Okay? So return to friend Allison. Imagine that instead of interdictation, Allison uh, having um, uh, 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 citing Fred, it's like, here's this most important objection to my thesis that comes from this guy, Fred, and he says this, and I'll just you, and so and so. Okay. Uh, rather, uh, she can't see past this 12 page uh, passage of the article and gets really preoccupied and is not able to engage with what's going on in the rest of the paper because she has to reinterpret what's going on in the rest of the paper in order to better fit with the fact with her a priori constraint that he must not be talking about analyticity and synthetic because he said so. Okay, I think in that case, she's really going to fail to engage with his ideas. Okay? I think this happens all over the place in philosophy. I think it's a very common vice of people entering the field that you, because you buy into the ideals of philosophy and engagement with ideas and with uh, rational persuasion rather than with uh, causally explaining people away and saying, oh, of course they think that because they're from USC. Okay, uh, you grant that there's something bad about that and you buy into this value, which I think is the right value, but you take it too far. I've had many students who Fred Michael Smith's book, The Moral Problem, and gotten really sidetracked for a long time because they, they thought they couldn't understand what was going on. So why don't you understand what's going on? And they said, well, he says that you have a reason to do something just in case your fully rational self would advise you to do it. I said, yeah, that's the deal. I said, well, does your fully rational self give conflicting advice? Like, surely the fully rational self will say, do this, uh, or do this. They won't say, you don't say, well, should I go to the store? And they'll say, well, I advise you to go to the store, and I advise you not to go to the store. Or, you know, should I, uh, should I make a friend? And a friend, they said, well, you should make a friend, but you should also not make a friend. It would be really weird if they give you conflicting advice all the time. Yet there are almost always reasons on both sides of any reasonable decision, certainly anyone you'd bother asking your ideal advisor about, okay? And so the idea that you have a reason to do something, just in case your fully rational self would advise you to do it, that's obviously false. And so, this, this is very typical of the kind of thing that people just contort themselves. Well, what does he mean? What's going on? I think what he means is he forgot about the difference between a reason and most reason. And I don't even think he forgot about it. I think he just didn't think about it. Okay, that's my causal interpretation of what's going on. A really simple interpretation. It's not a big mistake. It doesn't make Michael Smith stupid. It just means that there's stuff he didn't think about. And there's always stuff we didn't think about. Pick any article you love in philosophy that you think is awesome. There's something the author didn't think about which might have that kind of implications once you start poking on the right things. Okay. So I think this is totally normal. And it's a vice. We fail to engage with ideas when we over-rationalize in these ways. You have to have available as an interpretive tool, as a philosopher, the ability to see past this. Okay. Same thing happens, I think, in life. So uh, if, um, if somebody's really upset about something that's happened and her friend doesn't realize that it just brings back memories from her childhood, then the friends can respond all the wrong ways. Okay? Just like Maria complains about the Jasmine, I don't realize this is because she had a bad day. Uh, I'm gonna be really trying to persuade her, no, it's coming in really well, or like, do we really need to rethink whether we're gonna abide by the law about when we can water things? And those are all the wrong, we're not gonna really get to it. If I wanna figure out what's going on, uh, I need to see past that. Okay. Awesome, so why is it that interpreting causal terms is okay sometimes within the participant stance, and it's not okay other times within the participant stance. I want to say something totally naive that's motivated by the philosophy version of this case, and then I want to apply it to the life version of the case. Okay, so the totally naive thing is that I think that when, what's her name, I keep forgetting it, Allison is interpreting Fred, what she's doing is she's being charitable. She's applying a version of the principle of charity or something that might be called charity to Fred's article. Okay? And the principle of charity doesn't just make everything he says true. I know that's the Davidsonian principle of charity. 
But the right version of the principle of charity doesn't make everything they said too true. Rather, it, what it does is it finds the best, greatest contribution that could be theirs. Okay. And when we find the best, greatest contribution that could be somebody's, and we take their contribution to be that thing, we're being charitable. Okay. So whatever would have been going on in Fred's article, if there really was some rational explanation of these 12 pages, would be much less interesting for Allison's dissertation than what they were actually going in, given this is the correct explanation of why he has those 12 pages. Okay? Uh, and so the way to get to the best contribution that says the most, that says the most valuable thing, and is the most distinctive contribution to the field, the way to identify that thing sometimes requires seeing past some evidence that is not the correct interpretation, that's not the most faithful to what they actually said. Okay? And so what I think this shows is that when we interpret things, there are a number of criteria that are at stake. One of the criteria is we want a good contribution. We, when we interpret works in the history of philosophy, we think, oh, we're interested in them because we think there are good ideas there. Okay? But we also are interested in them because we think that they made contributions. That, some, that there was this really important development that happened in the history of philosophy. The people had this false, bad <laughs> idea, but it was really important. And this person was the one who started it. And it really changed. That's a big contribution. We wouldn't want to wash that out by just looking for them to have something we thought was truer or a better idea. Okay? But of course, we're looking for interpretations that are recognizably their own. Okay? But the third criterion that we're looking for something that's recognizably somebody's own contribution is not definitive. It does not rule out, as part of our interpretive process, deciding that this thing, that even if they disavow, really is their contribution. Okay, because one of the things that's at play in looking for their contribution is even their own avowals or disavowals of what their contribution are, are some of the things that we can push into the causal background. Okay, so imagine that you are interpreting an ancient text, and it becomes a life question for you whether the text has experienced corpus integrity, whether actually all of this, this book comes from the same author. So for example, you notice something that nobody's noticed for a long time, which is that in chapter two, the author says, well, I definitely don't think that P, uh, and, and uh, I think that Q, and in chapter seven, the author says, I've never said that Q. And you start to wonder, maybe somebody inserted chapter seven, or maybe they inserted chapter two. And it becomes a question for you, which of those two chapters were inserted by somebody else? Maybe more chapters were inserted by somebody else, but you don't know that yet, okay? When you do that, you're engaged in the process of interpretation, and one of the things you might do in that interpretation is reject some things as authentically part of the contribution. Okay. If that can happen in cases of corpus integrity, where you're not sure which, which author something came from, then what I'm suggesting is that there's something just more general, that even when everything comes from the same person, if not everything that a person says is part of their contribution, then it can even be the case that when in chapter two they say, uh, I, think that, I don't think that P, I think that Q, and in chapter seven I've never said that Q, uh, something is going wrong, and we have to decide which of those two things that they say to reconcile with what's really going on. Okay? And sometimes it's not possible, but sometimes it is. Sometimes we can explain this point in chapter 7 is that they got referee number 2, and they had to say something to referee number 2, and actually it was a bad idea to say something to referee number 2, and even maybe they knew it, but <laughs> this is the way they were going to get their book published. Okay? Sometimes there are explanations that allow us to understand this, and if there can be really simple ones like that, then sometimes there can be more complex ones, I think. Okay. How am I doing? All right. Um, so if this goes for interpretation of philosophical texts, I think uh, uh, a live question we should ask ourselves is why is it that it's epistemically appropriate? Why is it that it's wise or we're doing a good job figuring out what's going on in the text to look for the best interpretation? Maybe the, best, maybe the real interpretation is not the best one along these dimensions, okay? And I think here's an explanation of why this is a good practice. It's a good practice because that's what somebody's contribution is. The thing that somebody's contributed is the best contribution it could be. Okay? If the thing that is, cons that is most consistent with what could be recognizably their own, and yet is significant and valuable, that's what I think philosophical contributions are. That's an answer to why it is that charitable interpretation is absolutely appropriate and not just misguided. Okay. Um, similarly, I want to suggest that if what's going on in these cases of textual interpretation is that we're applying charity, similarly what might be going on in cases 
uh, interpretation of persons is that we're applying to. After all, it looks like when Allison is applying, not Allison, when I am applying this principle to Maria, where at some point I say, well, maybe she had a bad day. Um, part of what I'm doing is I am screening off part of what's going on, part of the behavior, which has real effects, and I might resent her for it. If, like she took it out of me yesterday, and now she took it out of me today. Uh, or uh, I might be happy about it. I was like, now I can blame her, like I couldn't blame her before. I might have all kinds of reactions to it as effects, but I screen it off as a contribution. It's not part of what she's contributed to our relationship. And I'm able to do that uh, precisely because I'm trying to be charitable. I'm trying to find the best thing that she's contributed to our relationship. Okay. Suppose that's true. Then we take the same question. Epistemically, why is charitable interpretation of persons appropriate? And the answer I want to give is the same. Persons are the best interpretation of the behavior of their body. If that's true, that's the kind of thing that would explain why it is that it's epistemically appropriate to interpret persons in this way. Awesome. So I think this is a wacky idea. Uh, it's very non-obviously true. And yet I think it's a very fruitful idea. So I want to close by pointing some of the ways in which I think it's fruitful. So I think this makes persons on this view out to be a kind of aspirational kind. On this view, persons are already the best we can be. Okay, that's what you are, is you are the best you can be. I, I like, kind of like that. <laughs> you feel good. Um, and, uh, it also, I think, has some powerful implications. There's a large literature in philosophy about finding the true self, whether what the actions that are authentically yours are the ones that you endorse, or that uh, proceed from a volition, uh, uh, that's a desire that you just desire to be effective, or uh, from some of your values, or from some, or perhaps from some disjunction of those things. Uh, and all of those views look for a place in your psychology to be you. So we can, and the point of this is to screen up something that's not authentically yours. To identify that there's some stuff you do that we don't really think is part of your contribution. And the project is to look for where in your psychology the true you is, okay? And my suggestion is this is misguided. The true you is the best interpretation of everything. And so it's no wonder that when people say that uh, the true you it proceeds from your volitions, you say, well, what if you have a desire not to act on that volition? What happens with third order desires? Okay, or what happens if your values are inconsistent with this? I'm gonna say, awesome. Sometimes it goes one way, sometimes it goes the other way. It depends holistically on what the best interpretation is. So I find this illuminating and resolving some things that I find kind of vexed. Um, I'm not gonna say anything about the work in. I'm not gonna say anything about that in development. Uh, what I am gonna do is come back to circumstantial evidence that this wacky view, the interpretive view about persons, is correct. So far I got to this view, the interpretive view about persons, by analogy with what's going on in the philosophical text. I was trying to make the case throughout the talk that there are some robust analogies between the ways in which interpreting a person, interpreting a text, uh, can be depersonalizing, or feel like they bring you down, or bring the author of the text down, in ways that don't, okay? And so I've been trying to give the robust analogy, and then I first argued that with respect to interpretation of text, what we're after is charity, but it's really weird to wonder why charity would be academically appropriate unless we think that the best interpretation of philosophical text is the contribution of that text. We're actually identifying what's going on, okay? And then I said the same thing for persons. But I think we can extend and find some further circumstantial evidence that this way of understanding persons has fruits. So the first thing I wanna say is that, actually second on your handout, it explains in which, uh, the sense in which uh, some kinds of interpretation is depersonalizing. Why it feels, these ways of bringing you down feel like being treated like a thing. They feel like being treated like a thing because when you were brought down in ways that are inconsistent with identifying the best contribution uh, that you're making, um, you are being treated in a way that is the kind of way that a thing would be treated, okay? That's why it is that these feel depersonalizing because that's what it is to be a person, is to be the kind of thing uh, of which uh, people the best that you can be, okay? The second thing I wanna say is that it fits with um, the kind of asymmetries that we observe between which kinds of uh, causal interpretation or license that is perfectly appropriate within the participant stance, and which kinds of causal interpretation take us out of the participant stance. And there are very naive things that you can say about this. So one of the things you probably noticed about my complement complaint cases is that the complement seemed positive and the complaint seemed negative. 
Okay, and so you might think there's some kind of asymmetry there that has to do with positivity and negativity. And again, the idea that what your contribution is as a person is the best interpretation of your behavior, as long as part of the best interpretation is doing something that's of value, things that you do that are of value are going to be better candidates for being worse, whereas things that you do that are of disvalue are going to be less good candidates for being worse. Okay? However, because finding the best thing that you could have done is not the only constraint interpretation, the idea that persons are the best interpretation of their behavior also explains ways in which you wouldn't want to overgeneralize this positive negative asymmetry. It can be, even though complaints in some sense seem negative, many kinds of complaints do make real contributions. It's not the case that nobody ever makes any complaints just because uh, they'll be bad if everybody's complaining about each other. And so we interpret that out of the way. Actually, one of the constraints on interpretation is you make a poor contribution. And uh, making a contribution is something that can compete sometimes with whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And also, whether it's positive or negative can be on different dimensions. It can be a very good thing that you did uh, to correct misunderstanding we've had in a relationship that you thought I was doing the gardening and I'm not up to snuff. Okay? That's not how my wife thinks about it, but for example. Um, all right. Um, a third thing that I think is really helpful about this um, way of, about the uh, interpretive theory of persons is that it makes a really nice distinction between failed effort at interpretation and lack of effort. So there's some times when we feel depersonalized in how somebody engages with us uh, because we feel like they're just not even trying. So like when you log into that blog, the philosophy blog, after you publish your paper in uh, Philosophical Studies, uh, and you read people saying, ah, so of course this is what people are going to do at Econom nowadays. Uh, and uh, it feels like they're not trying. They're not looking and trying to get with your ideas. Rather, they've just jumped to treating you as an object of study. Okay? That's something that can happen sometimes. But another thing that can happen that can feel deeply depersonalizing is that people can be trying to interpret you and getting it wrong. So in particular, if one of the dimensions of interpretation is to identify something that you've done or contributed that's a value, and if what's of value and how good it is is the kind of thing which admits a reasonable disagreement, then sometimes it's going to happen that uh, somebody is engaging and trying to interpret your behavior, but because they've allowed themselves this thing which would be advice not to allow, namely screening off some of your behavior in causal terms, if they've misapplied the values because they've got the wrong values, then they might interpret something that's very important to you and central to who you are and your contribution as just part of the causal background. And if they do so, they're going to depersonalize you. They're going to bring you down from what your interpret real interpretation is. And you're going to feel really negatively about it. You're like, yeah, I thought I just said that and you weren't listening. And of course they're not listening because they think you didn't really mean it. Okay. Uh, uh, that's a second way of depersonalizing that I think is, doesn't come from lack of sincerity. It comes from lack of success. I think it's really important to distinguish failures that come from lack of success from lack of sincerity, okay? Because they're bad and they think they're wrong people, but there is something still to be said for the people who are engaged with them, okay? And I think sometimes we miss that distinction, okay? Uh, 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 consequence of the fact that people can be sincere and get things wrong is that I think this picture leads to a diagnosis of what I call relationship pathologies. So relationship pathologies happen uh, in every interesting relationship, I think. And I think there are the ones I'm interested in are, I think, a consequence of the fact that people have slightly or extremely different values. Okay? What happens when people have slightly or extremely different values is that when they're both sincere in trying to interpret both themselves and the other person, uh, there can be clashes in that each person makes a contribution or takes themselves to make a contribution which they believe to be central. Uh, and the other person discounts it and is incapable of gratitude or appreciation and wants them to stop doing that. And uh, you think that if somebody wants you to stop doing something, you think, no, this is really me. This is like the best thing I'm doing in our relationship. And they want you to stop. That they don't love you or like they're not they're, they're, Like what, what are they thinking? Like this is who you are. And actually they don't think that's who you are. They think that you're something else and this is part of the causal background. I think these examples come up all over the place. So in the paper, I've got an example of uh, Ingrid and Marissa. Marissa is a well-to-do aunt who doesn't have children of her own, and she didn't get any help growing up. She made it on her own, 
that as far as people actually make it on their own. She believes herself to make it on her own, and she really wants to give back to her and nephews, so she's very generous with them. She gives them all kinds of advice, which she kind of expects them to follow, and she gives them money. And Ingrid is one of the nieces, and Ingrid uh, really uh, is attracted to Locke rather than so. And Ingrid really wants to be autonomous and make her own decisions and make it on her own. In fact, Ingrid wants to make it on her own the same way that Marissa did, which Marissa doesn't value. Marissa resents the fact that she had to make it on her own, but Ingrid really wants to make it on her own. And so Marissa is very generous with Ingrid, and Ingrid's incapable of gratitude to Marissa for this generosity. She wants her to stop, okay? And Marissa doesn't understand the request not to stop because the request to stop, she thinks, uh, can't be part of what Ingrid's really after. She thinks it's a matter of ungratefulness in this relationship. Okay, and it's not ungratefulness per se. Anger is totally capable of being great, grateful. It's just that you can only be grateful to somebody who's made a contribution. And Ingrid sees Marissa's generosity as a pathology, as a kind of compulsion. Like she feels like she's got to do this, and she won't listen to me. And the fact that she won't listen to me is evidence that it's a compulsion. <laughs> because here I am saying, <laughs> stop it. And uh, on the first reverse side, Marissa is thinking, oh no, uh, um, uh, she's not listening to me saying well, how important this is. And here they are not, not meeting right by. This happens all over the place. And I think that it's illuminating to see how this happens because there are all these places where we wonder how is it that our partners and our relationships are really not listening to us in these ways. And this is a diagnosis of how that could be that's compatible with sincerity. Okay? It is not awesome. Okay, it's a problem. And knowing that it's true doesn't make it possible to be grateful or have whatever other attitude because sometimes even knowing what you're doing doesn't tell you that the other person's interpretation is right and yours is wrong. You might still think your interpretation is right and their interpretation is wrong. A further consequence of this that I think comes out is that when these you have these kinds of relationship pathologies, whether they're within a close interpersonal relationship or just between strangers, that people, uh, each person set, thinks that they made an important contribution and the other person thinks, ah, oh, that's not really part of what's going on, is that people have been silenced. Okay, I think it's a really interesting kind of silencing that's different from some others. And it's kind of subtle because it's hard to identify who's been silenced and how they've been silenced. Okay, it's partly to value the question whether Ingrid or Marissa both uh, have been silenced in terms of how what they take their contributions to be. It's not that they haven't engaged in speech acts; they've successfully engaged in speech acts. The problem is that those speech acts have not been taken to come from their true self, be part of their authentic contribution. Okay? So again, I think it's a fruitful consequence of this way of thinking. And I'm going to stop. Thank <laughs> you.